Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode five, which is part two of our Cold War conversation with Shane Whaley of Spybury. We talked for some time, so I've split this interview into two parts. I hope you find this second half as interesting as I did. So settle in for a wide ranging and hopefully interesting conversation with my good friend Shane Whaley. I mean, just, you know, you can't, I mean, people kind of look at my East German stuff and say, oh, you're a communist, you support the GDR. There's absolutely yeah. no way anybody in their right mind would support that. Yeah. Let's be yeah. honest. I don't think there's any, you know, communist out there that really supports the building of that wall. No, some extreme, well, there's extremes everywhere. But um, I think, you know, look, looking back on, you know, the East Germany, I mean, because that whole wall thing, that freedom to travel was one, was the, you know, what, one of the key pieces that, that built up that, you know, the, the frustration. I mean, I know there were, lo- you know, there were a load of others there, but that restriction on freedom to travel was, you know, was or must have been one of the main drivers. Absolutely, especially if you had family in the West that you weren't able to see, or the Hungarians were able to travel and you weren't, um, or you know, people was it people over sixty or sixty-five that could get a thirty-day pass out and then were coming back with stories, or even worse, I you know, I remember asking that same colleague, I was like, well, you know, what what was your view of the West? And she said, well, I remember watching West German TV and and seeing commercials for Disney World and knowing I would never ever be able to go. Mm. Yeah, it's like exactly. living on another planet, really. Well, it is. I mean, I remember as a kid seeing adverts for Florida, knowing I'd never go because we couldn't afford it, not because yeah. the government said you couldn't go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but then you have to also, you, that, that wall, there are so many discussions around it, you know, did that wall prevent World War Three? because it meant nobody was going to attack um, the Western Territory and vice versa? I actually think in the long run, the Americans were kind of pleased it was there. Well, it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, there are s- some uh, some stuff I've read around when the war went up in 61, you know, there, there was almost a sigh of relief because, you know, there, wa- there, there was more certainty and yes. more delineation around, you know, where the West ended and where the, where the East started. And, you know, the influx of refugees from the East was – whilst it was a, a massive brain drain and skills brain in East Germany, was becoming a massive burden to the West as well. Yeah, huge. Um, and there's different, you know, there's people who say, oh, yeah, but all those East Germans, they would have come back. I was reading something earlier, some critique about um, a book. I don't know if you've read it. Um, can I bring it with me today? Yeah, I picked this one up recently called Behind the Berlin Wall, an Encounter in East Germany, Stephen Kellman. No. I haven't read that uh, one. I'll, I'll, no, it's one that I, it's, um, I think it was written in the 70s. Anyway, so he basically goes to East Germany. He didn't expect to get let in, and he, he got to stay for 30 days. And I was reading um, a rebuttal of this book, and uh, it was, was it Neil Acheson? Uh, uh, yeah, Neil Acheson. I'll right. send you the links. Um, that might be interesting to have a look at for further study. But he was saying, oh, no, if the war wasn't there, people would have gone to West Germany, and then they would have come back. Why is this guy saying they wouldn't? I'm like, poppycock. There's absolutely no way. Why would people return? Uh, when the country was collapsing and they, they had no freedom, um, I just don't. I don't see that argument. Mm. So well, it's, it's interesting because I mean, if you if you take the example of uh, Czechoslovakia in '68 with the Prague Spring, yeah, there was a freedom of movement there for people to leave the country, and people did come back. Obviously, some people stayed when you know the Warsaw Pact invasion occurred. You know, they they yeah. stayed out, outside of Czechoslovakia, but there was some freedom. 
freedom of of movement there so yeah it's I mean, if, and, if and, and even when the wall fell in you know november 89 there were people who'd crossed into berlin who then into west berlin who then you know um struggled to get back in because the border guards wouldn't let them back in <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's just it, it's it's fine. I, i'd love you to get a team of historians on your show for one of your episodes and, and really hammer this one because i just think it, it, you could have hours on this conversation well um, i've got a uh that one of my uh next episodes is with um richard millington who runs ddr online on brilliant uh, uh, great now we, we're talk we're going to be talking specifically around the uh 1953 east german um uprising yes um but um, I'd like to get him, you know, obviously get him back again and, and have a wider conversation. I think, and that I think you great. should be on the panel, Shane, as well. Well, with somebody like Richard, I, I would be quite nervous because I love that guy's Twitter. He's got so much, not, you know, he's a real historian. Um, so thank you. I mean, I, I'd like to take part, but, you know, my, mine is more from just amateur reading. Um, I feel that Richard. Yeah, like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, incredible. And I, this is why I'm so excited about your podcast. And, you know, we talked back in, in December about you doing it. You know, they're just the people you can bring on here. And a lot of the books that are out there now are either really dry and academic or they're old and things have changed. And that's the other really fascinating thing about reading about the GDR books, you know, David Charles and so on, is that now we've got further information from when those books were written and you can put it into context a little bit better and, uh, you know, You've, you've got the benefit of the history along with reading those books. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Shane, I had some sort of like, um, sort of left a field questions for you out, outside yeah. of our conversation around the GDR. So, mm-hmm. um, if you were a filmmaker with an unlimited budget, what cold war incident would you recreate on film and why? Well, I think, one of the most notorious people who went into East Germany was this guy called Ian Sanders. He'd been to see a gig <laughs> in West Berlin and uh, he reckoned he was going in just as, you know, a teenager. Now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a film. I mean, I, when I read Marcus Wolf's book, I really wish somebody had come up with a film about his life, mm. you know, starting from uh, moving to Russia with the, when the Nazis came in to him covering Nuremberg to becoming the head of the HVA. I think there's plenty of stuff there. Yeah. Um, for a movie. Uh, I also would really enjoy the whole placing of Gunter Graham um, in the brand government. I think that would be fascinating as well. And I'm um, surprised there's not, I, I'm, there's probably some German film out there that covers that. I you would think thought. so, right? I mean, uh, I, I don't know. This is one of the reasons why, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to learn German, living where I do. I don't get a chance to speak it that much. And I work for a company that's very international, so it's not all German in the office. But, you know, this is one of the reasons why I really would love at some point to go and do a six-month intensive German course and watch some of this because I'm pretty confident there must be something or at least, a, you know, a, a recreation of those events. Yeah. And of course, you know, Schabowski, I mean, that whole thing. Um, see, someone asked me the other day, would you write a spy book? And if so, what would it be on? And I'm like, well, you know, for me, everything's kind of been done. But... I would love to write one of these you know, f- fictional historical books about Schabowski actually being a British agent and that all being a <laughs> setup. Because if you, if you read what happened that day, it's like, how can that happen? How can a government official say immediately? Yeah, um, so you're, you're talking about this, this was the press conference where yes, this East German official, Schabowski, sort of picked up this piece of paper randomly, absentmindedly, read it out, which said, you know, people from East Germany can travel abroad. And he was asked by the press, well, when does this start? And he just looked blankly and said, immediately. So what? It, yeah. it sounds like, you know, the, the ultimate sort of screw up because Absolutely. none of the border guards were prepared for it or had been warned about it and, you know. It was, and there's a good, uh, there's a good movie. Unfortunately, it's just in German called Bornholmer Strasse. Um, yeah, that is good. That is you've good. seen that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, it's comedic of course, but you kind of feel sorry for these border guards. They don't know what to do. They've got all these people outside the, you know, the gate want to come in, we're allowed through and it's, it's what they do. And I, lo- and I don't want to spoil it for him, but I love that last scene. I don't know if you remember it when he just comes home as if he just had a normal day at work. <laughs> it's just yeah. brilliant. Just brilliant. Um, yeah. so th- those, that that event in itself, I think, would make for great dramatization. Yeah. Um, 
also, you know, George Blake's escape um, from from London. I mean, the story of George Blake, mm-hmm. as much as the traitorous bleep, um, you know, compelling viewing if you made that into a movie. And probably one if you watched and said, oh, there's no way anyone could escape the scrubs like that and get back to Moscow. You'd think it's very far-fetched. And that's one of the reasons I love doing Spybury is, is a lot of the, the true spy sports stories are kind of hard to believe. Yes. No, you're, you're right. I mean, they are sort of like if somebody wrote that in a book as a piece yeah. of fiction, you'd think, come off it. Poison Umbrella on, on the bridge. Yeah. Waterloo, whatever. No, but uh, so there, there are a couple of events I think I, I would want to film. Make, okay. Make, so, make. so what would you have as the soundtrack? You know, what, what piece of music or pieces of music or bands do you think would be the, the, the soundtrack for a good Cold War film? So, I mean, I really loved the soundtrack to Deutschland 83, um, primarily because it was of its time. Things like, yeah. you know, New Waters, Blue Monday, superb. I love it when that, that comes on. Yeah. But I'm particularly partial to a piece of music that I, I only discovered this composer. Now, I'm a Swansea boy, right? I don't really do classical music stuff that much. But um, <laughs> I, I was reading the Dayton book. Uh, I forget which one it was. Maybe it was Spy Hook. And he was talking to a, a, a conductor who had, who had conducted um, a guy called uh, Bruckner. Mm-hmm. And then I looked into Bruckner and thought, well, was, you know, Len Dayton, although he's writing a fictional story about, you know, a British agent in Berlin, uh, you know, he tends to draw on a lot of true events. Uh, so I thought, well, Bruckner clearly must have been, um, you know, decreed acceptable by the GDR. And then I started listening to his music. And he's quite, he's quite like Wagner in many ways in, in terms of his musical style. But his Ninth Symphony, which was his last one, I listened to that and I just, it, it's dark, it's stormy, it's, it's rebellious in parts. And I think that would make a very good backdrop to a, a, a particularly a life of a spy. Yeah. Maybe tucked away in East Berlin. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I will add a link to that in the show notes so people can listen to that as well i'm i'm familiar with bruckner but not particularly his music you know i've i've heard of the name so uh yes that that sounds good so if you could invite three personalities from the cold war to uh have a few pints with um who would they be i guess one of them was going to be marcus wolf (laughs) yeah top of the list i mean (laughs) It, it frustrates me sometimes that I, there's some great interviews with him on YouTube that, you know, my German just isn't there to get it. Um, I'm also really intrigued by his speech uh, that he gave in 89, uh, mm. Alexander Platz. You know, what exactly was he saying? Because, you know, he was number two in the Stasi, head of foreign intelligence. You know, what is he saying up there to justify the GDR? Because he'd uh, retired a few years before, hadn't he? Yes, yeah. he had. Um and I just think it would be great to, to sit him down, you know, with a meal and really, you know, understand, you know, what was Milka like, what was Hanukkah mm-hmm. like, you know, setting up the agents, et cetera. Uh, just, you just have so much conversation with him. I think, see, I wanted to pick Eric Honecker as my second, but I think he'd be quite boring. Um, well, based, still... on your, based on your review of his book, <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> And his speeches, uh, yeah. he's, not, he's not bombastic at all. But I think I'd still want to invite him because I'd be really interested in, in what happened during the Second World War. Uh, I'd be very interested in the planning because, of course, he was the architect and engineer of the Berlin Wall. Sometimes people forget that. Yeah. Although it was on Ulbricht's watch, it was Erich who, uh, or, I mean, that's, that's hell of a feat. That's hell of an engineering feat to, to, to build a border like that pretty much overnight. Well, Paul, that sort of surprise as well. Yeah. I mean, there were inklings of it, but nobody really knew when. Uh, but was it a surprise or did we know? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I would have to get Eric in there to have a chat. Um, third, I would actually pick John Pete, uh, who yes. I mentioned earlier on today. Yeah. I've, got, I've, I've not read his book. I've got it here and it's been on my to-do read list for a long time. Um, the, I think it's called The Long Engagement. And he fascinates me because, of course, he's, he's a Westerner who defected to East Berlin. So he just turned up in the 50s, gave his press conference that, yeah, I've defected to East Germany. A lot of it was against the rearming, um, rearming, uh, uh, rearming uh, West Germany. He was also quite anti-American foreign policy, and that's why he went across. But, you know, he, he didn't go across and kind of live in misery. He really embraced the GDR. Like I say, he was head of the, uh, the, 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 the propaganda newspaper in English. He uh, wrote quite a lot of, I think, letters around the world to, to various newspapers defending the GDR. So it would be interesting to have someone who's British 
mm. um, at the dinner table where someone chat about why he defected and did he really like it there or you know what did he really think about the GDR etc and get to that and if I may squeeze a four in there I actually um, would love to invite Richard Nixon um, from just because of how, what he did with with Mao meaning Mao with Brezhnev his involvement in Vietnam. Um, a lot of the uprisings. You know, if you look at Nixon's career, which started in '47 when he became a congressman in California, right through to him becoming a vice president, through some very turbulent years under Eisenhower, uh, and then of course president from '68 with Vietnam. Um, I think he would make for fantastic dinner conversation. Of course, we'd have to make sure that uh, there's no uh, tape recordings anywhere. Although I'm sure he would check for those himself. Um, but I think those four for dinner and your good self, Ian, would be one hell of a night. Well, hey, yeah, there would be more than a few pints that night, I think. Definitely, definitely. Fantastic. So are there any books that, in English, obviously, um, that you particularly recommend for anybody interested in the history of the GDR? Yeah, I mean, there's lots. And I, what I would say to people as a bit of a warning is you have to be careful who's written the book. Um, what side of the argument they're on, particularly a lot of the books that came out in the 70s and 80s. I've got quite a few that uh, are obviously written by sympathizers. But then you do have wonderful books. Uh, the one Frederick Taylor wrote on the Berlin Wall is definitive for me around the history of the Berlin Wall. Mm-hmm. Um, Stasi Land and a Funder is definitely worth a read. You know, these are books that interview people who lived in the GDR at the time. Uh, Born in the GDR, Hester Vesey is also a good read. Yeah, I I enjoyed a book called The File by Timothy Garton Ash. Yes, uh, that that's interesting about the English journalist who went and checked out his Stasi file. Yeah, absolutely. So he went over there to study German um, in East Berlin, and of course he he's now a famous Oxford lecturer. Uh, and he went and checked up his Stasi file, and he recreated his whole life or his youth in East Berlin through his Stasi files. I think his nickname was Romeo. I'm sure his wife was well chuffed to hear that. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's got a, you know, you'd, you'd want to have that as your code name, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, that's a really interesting read because he writes a lot about his life in East Berlin. Obviously, uh, Man Without a Face, Marcus Wolf, mm-hmm. uh, is, is number, one, number one read. And I mean, even if you're not into GDR history, just from an espionage perspective, that, that's an awesome read. There was an interesting one I picked up called Letters Over the Wall, David Strack. Now, this isn't brilliantly written, but the the caveat here, the story is he uh, was a school teacher, German language school teacher from the States, and he was in East Berlin in the 70s, taking tour groups over there. And uh, he kept uh, writing to, I think, four or five East Germans that he had met. So he's kept all the letters and he uh, publishes extracts of them in the book about their relationship over the, you know, from the 70s to the fall of the wall. Again, this is conversations with ordinary, in air quotes, East Germans, which which I really enjoy. So that's a good one. And then I, I think you have to read um, the the David Child's books, uh, the GDR, Moscow's German Ally, Honecker's Germany um, is worth the read. Again, there are, those ones are a bit academic. Um, and he actually got followed by the Stasi, didn't he? Do you know Did that he, story? I, about him? No, I didn't. He was, so he was a lecturer out of Nottingham, and he was quite anti the GDR, very well read and anti the GDR. And I think with his Stasi file, he found out there was trade union lecturers, even at his own university, that were keeping tabs on him for the Stasi. Wow. He's still alive. And obviously he's getting on, but he would make for an awesome guest, by the way. Okay. I'll bear that in mind, Shane. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, don't think you're going back to your day job with all these wonderful guests that we all want you to interview. I'm running out of disk space, I'll tell you. (laughs) And, And I also, it's funny, I also remember reading a book this is a long time ago, called The Stasi Files by Anthony Gleese. And I remember yeah. really enjoying that book. It was about the Stasi's operations in the UK. But I checked on Amazon recently and it got absolutely panned, but never one to listen to popular oh, opinion. Oh, really? I, I haven't read it for a while. I've got it on my shelf here. Um, and I did find it interesting. I mean, there's no sort of like major surprises in there, you know, of people that you know that were Stasi spies. But um, it was quite interesting because it it did cover some of the academic institutions and and their infiltration there. Yes, Um, absolutely. And and trade unions as well as you've just described um, just a moment ago. So, um, you know... I'm going to read that one again soon. Um, 
I can't remember what the criticism of it was now. Yeah, I'll have to uh, revisit that one. Um, so uh, what film or TV series would you say is a, what, what you believe is a good factual or fictional representation of the GDR? I, d- I know you've mentioned Deutschland um, 83. Yeah, I think that goes without saying, to be honest. I mean, that, yeah, it's fiction. It's high drama. Uh, that's a, one of the very few German language productions that did very, very well in the United States. Um, so plenty of drama in it, but I still enjoyed it. I still, it was the case of the, the, you know, the main character being kind of forced to spy for his country so that his, his mother would get, I think it was cancer or leukemia. She had to get the treatment for that. And then the whole operation Abel Archer. So there's some truths in there. I, I thought it was, it was very well made. The soundtrack, if you love 80s music is superb. Mm. Um, I know many of your guests will or have already mentioned, you know, the life of others, which again is one of those musts watch um as well as goodbye lenin um in terms of cold war i mean one of my favorite movies is actually is this is going to be a left field choice but it's charlie muffin uh the charlie muffin movie and that actually starts at uh i think they're at zimmerstrasse or around checkpoint charlie trying to get people across and there's quite a lot of you know east german stuff in there as well as you know charlie muffin plotting against the cia uh the british secret service and, and the kgb uh, that's a good Cold War era movie. Right. Again, it's fiction, uh, yeah. written by the wonderful Brian Fremantle, but I, I enjoy that one. It's kind of hard to get factual um, stuff on the GDR. There's a couple of YouTube clips I really enjoy, and there's one uh, I, I think I've sent you before, and I'll, I'll email it to you for your listeners to listen to, which is a propaganda movie on on Berlin, Unsere DDR. And I love it because it's 10 minutes and it's just so dramatic. It starts off, you know, about how Russia liberated Berlin, um, how oh, yeah. Berlin is being, you know, Aufstand and they ruin and it's being built up from the ruins. Mm. And there's this clip about three minutes in where they talk about NATO and how evil NATO is. And it just plays this music that, like you're the cartoon villain <laughs> and it shows them all in NATO, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is brilliant stuff, you know, from yeah. a, a historical perspective. So there's tons of really good videos on, on YouTube. And in fact, when you asked me about Cold War, you know, uh, elements of Cold War we could use in a movie, there was the one thing you told me about when we met in London, about the, the brothers who got the micro light and flew in to trap. Oh, out. yeah, that is an amazing piece of video where they, and, yeah, they, have you, you've watched it, I take it. I've watched it a couple of times, and I was actually thinking that in preparation for this interview, this would actually be a really good movie to make. Yeah. Okay, we all know the ending, but the story, because didn't the two brothers, they escaped first and then there was one brother who didn't couldn't get over yeah he was left behind i can't remember for whatever reason and they hatched this plan to uh fly these micro light planes over disguised i think they put red stars on the wings so the border guards wouldn't shoot at them and then the, in the days before iphones and then web drones they're filming it they've cine filmed it somehow yeah. the whole and like you it's never just talked about now far-fetched box set right so two guys in a micro light fly over the iron curtain land in trap style park pick up the brother and fly back to west Berlin. whatever mate yeah yeah but no it yeah. happened and that's sensational i actually think if that youtube footage wasn't out there i don't know if i'd believe it no no well there wasn't there some guy who built his own submarine or something and got across the 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 border on the Baltic. I don't think it was a proper submersible, but it was sort of like, you know, there was only like a snorkel showing right. when it travelled. Uh, maybe I've just dragged right. one up from some, you know, one of your uh, reviews on Spybury, and I've uh, just completely dreamt that one up. I'm not sure. I think there were, and I remember when I was at the Checkpoint Charlie Museum years ago, they had various kind of, you know, vehicles that could go under the river, um, you know, just in incredible what, what people were building in order to escape yeah did um you mentioned that you're trying to learn german did you get my links i sent through on um the east german teach yourself english tv program i put them up on facebook i think um i can't remember if you haven't they are great it's sort of like you know now we are going to teach you how to say in english we are going to the meeting with the workers' militia. <laughs> or, you know, it's that sort of style of. Uh... You know, I need to go and revisit those links because I want. Now, you mentioned my performance review. I want to go in with my boss and, and come out with all that. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's brilliant. It's almost like a Monty Python sketch to some degree. You know, 
I mean, that's the thing. Everything about the GDR was propaganda from birth right through. Some of the other things I have in my collection um, are kids' books. And I have one called uh, Die Sieben Bruder, The Seven Brothers, and it's all about the Warsaw Pact um, armies. And it's kind of like told, you know, kids' stories in this book, but every couple of pages they have pictures of the different armies and the insignias and, you know, our seven brothers, you know, really interesting propaganda from a young age. I think that in particular is what really fascinates me yeah. about the GDR. And I know the other communist countries had this as well, but um, yeah, just, just, just mind blowing. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, go on. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I remember as a kid on TV, there was this program called the singing ringing tree and it was a fairy tale thing, uh, show. And um, it scared the, be Jesus out of me. I mean, it ter- It was really creepy. Right. And I only recently discovered it was made in East Germany. Oh, wow. You should look at it on, uh, I think there were episodes on YouTube, but it I'll is creepy um, East German kids sort of drama show. Yeah, I'll check that uh, out. Doesn't yeah, the same ringing tree. You'll have nightmares. Don't watch it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure there's some politics in there as well somewhere knowing gdr's the indoctrination yeah actually i hadn't looked at it in that way you're right there's probably Must the be. um yeah there's probably a nazi somewhere in there or the nato or something like that yeah sure. yeah yeah oh no i'll have to uh revisit that as well yeah but definitely. shane i have taken a lot of your time this evening and I'm sure we could carry on chatting certainly into the early hours, my time. Yes. It's Um, an absolute pleasure. I'm really loving what you're doing because as someone who loves reading the history and doesn't really have anybody to talk to about it. And again, I would say to your listeners, you know, to check out Ian's Facebook group because I'm seeing that now it's starting to, um, to grow. There's some great posts on there and I'm continuously learning. And it's nice to speak to like-minded people that have an interest in this because what I, and I, I'll give an example of something that happened the other day. And I don't know if she's going to listen to this show. If she does, tough. Um, somebody wrote to me and said, you do this uh, quick fire round where you say you're, you're stuck in East Berlin and it's a bit like desert island discs, right? But what can you take? You do realize there are still people out there that were tortured by the Stasi and they, the Stasi and, and they won't take kindly to you saying this. I think, you know, you're being too jovial about it. I'm like, come on, really? Like I am not in any way supporting the former GDR. No. And that's the thing here where I, I think Richard, when he guess, says he doesn't condemn or criticize, he's just showing the history. And I will criticize because there's a lot to criticize about the GDR. But I just am interested in talking about the politics, the propaganda, the ordinary life, the aesthetics. Um, I know that Rob does Dayton Dossier. He might be worth talking to as well at some point. He's got a bit of a GDR collection going there as well. And, you know, none of us are, are, are card carrying communists. And I think that's the, the important distinction. So your group, particularly on the GDR, and I know you're going to branch it out to the other. Uh, Warsaw Pact countries as well, because I'm really interested in what happened in Romania, you know, Czechoslovakia. Um, I'm fascinated by that as well. Uh, so I'd urge people yeah, to, to we'll, join we'll be absolutely covering that. Definitely. Um, and actually, you know, last week when your, your guest was talking about the football, you know, I dug out a load of my programs uh, that I've got from when Swansea, my hometown, played uh, Lokomotiv Leipzig and Magdeburg. I've uh, got a lot of Dynamo Dresden programs as well. So, you know, it's, it's getting me to go back and raid my collection because, you know, it's in, it's in my East Berlin room and uh, it's good to go back and revisit stuff. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. And th- those are very kind words, Shane, because, you know, as you know, with Spybury, you, you don't always know whether you're hitting the mark um, with people. Um, and, you know, with your podcast, you're getting some, you know, fantastic feedback, very vibrant um facebook group um and and lots of of uh interaction there and that, that's where i'd like to take this because i think there's some great stories out there that haven't been told that deserve to be told and also for people to you know give their opinions about certain aspects of the cold war that we perhaps have preconceived ideas about I, I love it. And I think the key to your podcast and, and to your group is staying curious and staying open-minded, um, asking questions, you know, particularly if you do get to interview people who serve the GDR government in some way is, you know, is not being judgmental, but asking them the questions that we want to know. Uh, yeah. And we're curious. Like, I would love to interview a border guard or hear you interview a border guard about what life was like, you know, guarding, the, guarding East Germany. Um, yeah. Fascinating. 
Um, and I really enjoyed Mike Ferris's. It is Mike, right? Mike Ferris's yes. interview with yep. you on, on episode two about his life in Berlin. I mean, his babysitter taking him to East Berlin. I mean, what a story. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, the, the, all those kind of things, are, uh, just staying curious. Uh, and trying, like you said earlier on, we were veering on to politics. Well, we weren't really. I wasn't going to start debating, you know, market econ- economics with you. Um, but I'm fascinated in, in what that country was and how it was, in air quotes, again, surviving. Mm. Yeah. No, it, it's, uh, it, it is just a fascinating country and and the, the fact that it disappeared so quickly and that in fact the whole you know how the whole warsaw pact effectively imploded in the course of you know 12 yeah, months absolutely um is unbelievable because i i remember watching it and thinking i'm actually watching history happen you know this isn't something that i'm reading about in a history book i'm actually watching you know this happen and Maybe my kids will ask me about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm envious that you got to visit East Germany. I was too young. Uh, you know, I was 14 when the wall came down. There's no going there. But you've actually been there. I mean, I just read the books and try to imagine what life was like. But you actually went into East Berlin. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I, I was very lucky. But then again, you know, I just had a snapshot of it. You know, yes. it's just East Berlin. And that was the shop window of of the uh you know the gdr and i'd like to you know understand more what it was like in karl Marxstadt or frankfurt am Oder and you know some of some of these more um more distant places well that's it for this episode if you liked what you have heard please leave a review at itunes or your preferred podcast provider it really helps to spread the word and don't forget to join the discussion at our facebook page which is cold war conversations and you can also follow us on twitter at cold war pod thanks for listening this is the voice of america washington dc signing off (laughs) 